Okay, here we are. Barely. This is Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. Let me welcome you. Are you new? Welcome. Are you returning? Thank you. It has been a swirl of a few days, my friends. I moved two days ago, and this almost did not happen. I don't know what I was thinking. I don't know why I thought I was going to be able to get any work done. Last week, I told you that I was going to have a blog and a podcast out this week. Well, the blog definitely didn't get finished. I got some of it done, but I couldn't get all of it done. And the podcast was already recorded, and I just had to get this intro done. But I have never waited this long to record an intro up until the time that it needs to be done to get a podcast out to you. So we are like right up against the wire. I'm not exactly feeling in the most focused state to do it, but it's just now or never. So I'm going to do my best. And it's been really tumultuous. I mean, I feel joyful. I'm in the new house and that's really just amazing to be in this new place. But I'm sure many of you out there have had to move in your lives and it's incredibly stressful. I have none of my usual routines. I have no routines. And I can't find any of my stuff. <laughs> so I'm just feeling a little bit, you know, out of sorts and in disarray. But again, still joyful. There's all kinds of sort of crappy things that have been happening alongside all this joy. I kind of slightly wrecked my car. Not bad. I just dented the fender, barely. Driving through the city and I didn't bang into anybody else's car, but, you know, that was a drag. And then there's like all kinds of little things with the house, you know, that we're discovering. The gutters are all clogged up, so the water was not going in the right places and just all kinds of stuff, you know, almost too much. But these are the kind of problems that I kind of don't mind having. I don't mind trying to figure out this new place because I'm just grateful that we have it, that we have a new place to be at. And it is really wonderful. So once again, I am incredibly grateful to the powers that be and to all of you out there, again, for all your good wishes and support and your emails. Thanks for the emails, you guys. Again, keep them coming. I said I was going to read some, but once again, I'm not prepared. Next week, I promise. But for now, let's talk about this week. This week, I am sharing with you a conversation I had with Amy Matthews, who's been on the podcast before. I believe I also mentioned that it has been one of the most favorite episodes that I've ever put up, the most listened to. And I'm not surprised because Amy is just a really special person and deep teacher and just really, I've been talking about her and dropping her name and mentioning her for like months and months because I've been in her class. And right around when it was concluding, we sat down and I'm just really, really grateful to her for all that I learned from her. And what I really love about this conversation that you get to hear is in it, she completely blows my mind, which happened many times during the course of her class, but happened anew in the course of this conversation and you get to be in on it. So it's really good stuff. I'm excited for you to hear it today. Amy's got her new babies project happening and we'll have some links for that. So you should definitely check out her stuff. Before we listen to it, let me mention my stuff. I'm going to be in Helsinki, Finland, August 23rd through 30th. And my live stream thing is happening. Actually, I'm supposed to have a conversation with my producer like right now. He might be calling me while I'm doing this to like finalize the last little details, but it's definitely launching this week. In fact, I think when you're listening to it, it will have been launched All of my classes on any device 
for anyone who's not around in person to attend. And I'm going to start live streaming classes on Wednesday, the 5th of July. So come on over, hang out, take some classes with me wherever you are. Should be pretty cool. You can check it out along with the archives of this podcast and my blog, which the new one will come out next week, and all the video stuff, the DVD downloads, the online course, and this new live stream, all of that can be found at jbrownyoga.com. What else? All of this stuff that's been happening in the last few days comes off the cusp of my time at the Feathered Pipe Ranch. I, I did come to you last week from there, and it was a incredibly special trip. The place really did live up to the hype. It just has like a pretty special vibe. It like the nature is powerful there in a way that I hadn't really experienced before. As I mentioned, so much so I couldn't even really give over to it. I think it would have like left me too I don't know, mushy and ethereal to manage what I had to do over the last couple of days. So I, I really didn't give over to it. And I'm glad I didn't because I had a lot waiting for me here. But they booked me to go back again next year. And I'm excited for that. It's a special place. So kudos, Feathered Pipe Ranch. Thanks to everybody there. Let's see. Anything else? I don't know, you guys. I'm just doing my best to manage, and I think it's probably best for us just to get to the talk. So let's do that. I'll drop who's coming on next week on the other side and maybe say a few more things. We'll see if I can muster it. In any case, let's do it. Let's listen to this talk that I had with Amy Matthews. What are we going to talk about today? Uh -huh. It's a really good question. <laughs> well, you've been on the podcast before, mm -hmm. and we did like our origin story or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. which I'm starting to get to the point with the podcast where I just, if I have someone back on again, we can't, we can't do that again. Nope. Done that. We've done that. We don't need to do that. And, you know, it's been like a year and a half since we had that conversation, Really? Yeah. Wow. And okay. a lot's happened in that year and a half. I know for me and I think some for you. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's happened is that I've been in your course, which is something that I thought after we talked last time. I thought, if I'm going to be able to have a conversation with Amy, like about what Amy does, yeah, I have to have more experience with what she does. Yeah. Because you had some questions. I did. You were dubious. I was dubious about some things, but some things. it's so interesting how, as it's come to pass, those things that I went into became more and more irrelevant mm. <laughs> as I got what I think, or at least what I got from what you're doing more. Mm -hmm. Like those questions became like unnecessary mm -hmm. in certain regards, mm -hmm. which is kind of interesting given where we started together uh, with Mark and stuff, but we'll come back to that. Okay. So here's where I think a, a good place for us to start is maybe. Um, you know, last time I talked to you was early on in the podcast. I talked to Leslie too. And I can't remember. I think I had done his course. I was in the midst of doing his course. Mm -hmm. And it was also coming out of this renewed discussion about injuries and yoga and I was looking back and it was 2002, the first thing I ever wrote was called Notes from a Concerned Practitioner Teacher, where I was questioning some of the things that I had been taught and kind of giving myself permission to make my own determinations about things. And I took Leslie's course to sort of come up with some idea about this question that I wrote in a, another piece, which was called, Does Studying Anatomy Make Yoga Safer? You were quoted in that. Yes, I was. And, you know, what I, what I got from Leslie a lot was, okay, wait a second, anatomy is open to interpretation a lot like yoga is. 
And I really resonated with what Leslie does because we shared some same influences. So the lens through which he was looking at anatomy was one that I felt very at home with. Mm -hmm. And the focus on the breath Uh, as a vehicle. It reinforced many things that I was already doing Mm -hmm. and seemed to lend some anatomical credence to it or something like that. And so, you know, in that article I wrote, I sort of felt like, no, I don't know that studying anatomy makes yoga inherently safer at all. And since then, I actually think the discussion around injuries seems renewed even more. I think just more and more people getting hurt. Mm-hmm. <laughs> On, and being open about or, it. Or teachers, I should say that. I think everybody, it's not that people are getting hurt more than they were before. I think people were always getting hurt, even before we were having these discussions and before there was teacher training. Yes. It's just that teachers are being more honest about what happened in their own bodies through practice. Mm-hmm. So trying to get to my point, these days, whenever I hear people talking about the question about injuries, the word that always keeps coming up is this word biomechanics. Like the reason why people are hurting them so their teachers aren't is informed because they need to understand biomechanics more. So I've been in your course, and just like two weeks ago, we were looking at the bones that make up what I call my shoulder. And (laughs) she's laughing because of a careful choice of words that I use. Um, And so in that consideration, it became really clear to me that I've been doing something with my shoulders for a long time that I thought was a good thing. I had an idea about what I was doing with my shoulders and why I was doing it. And it's come to my awareness that I don't think I was right about that idea. And in fact, I think I I caused some issues because Mm. of that Mm. inaccurate idea. Mm. And so while I was coming to this sort of epiphany in your class, I raised my hand and I asked you just sort of like in a slight desperation in a sense of like, why, why? have I come to this idea? Why do I think this? And you didn't say, because you don't understand biomechanics. You pointed to a time in history when we started to think of our bodies as machines. And as soon as you said it, I thought of the word, biomechanics, body machine. And I thought, okay. And you said something about it now, but I want to hear more about this, about when we started thinking of our bodies as machines and like the ramifications of that in terms of how we think about our bodies. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> um, so I, I'm finding that I have this feeling that we are, um, like we as a culture are replacing one overly kind of linear perspective with another over linear perspective. And, and that biomechanics is kind of replacing or, or coming up instead of um, it, to replace something, but it's still two parts oriented. So this is my issue right now with biomechanics. And um, so, yeah, you, <laughs> I heard your question that like, how did we ever get to thinking we could control our bodies in this way? And, and I think it goes back to a perspective on the body, a shift in perspective on the body from some sense of wholeness to we are parts that are somehow um, enlivened by some spark that comes in from outside. And um, it, in, in looking at The more science I study, the more embryology I study, I also go look at where these ideas started. And like looking at the history of embryology and the ideas people had about conception, uh, like they thought that that there was a little tiny, tiny person in every sperm. And that sperm like landed in the egg and the egg was just fertile ground for the little person in the sperm to grow. And, And... like they were really, really sure about that. They were absolutely positive that that was a story. And that story came out of a perspective, out of a culture that said, um, women are receptacles 
and and men hold all of the um, knowledge and thought and rightness and the drawings of this little tiny person little sperm has this really big head because that's a really important part of like it's it's crazy and it's <laughs> and it's not only like the the problematic aspect of of the perspective on men and women but just the idea that the story the culture influences the stories we tell in science and what we're doing in science is telling stories and our stories are getting more and more refined but we're still stringing together the the measurable details to make some a narrative that makes sense to us and the narrative we create is a product of our perspective on everything including religion, including how the world works. So at a time when, um, at the, in the time when we were looking at how bodies work, we were also really valuing intelligence. We were really valuing analysis. We were not valuing the body. The body was dangerous. It was dirty. It was, I mean, the feminine aspect of it, but also just the like, in, in the spirit of the enlightenment, let's be rational and let's not be emotional and let's not, and these could be separated, right? So that whole mindset translated into our stories about how the body worked. And, the bo- and we, when we started doing dissections, well, dissections were happening for a long time, but really a lot of dissection, when dissecting the body became more acceptable, a little bit more acceptable, people started looking at how the parts work together. And they cut things apart, and they went, oh, look, this thing right here, this moves this. And they started looking for how we could, for um, how to make sense of it, and how to make a machine out of it. And, and I think that we lost something in there, and we, we tried to make the body match what we understood about machinery at the time. And it turns out there's all kinds of things happening in the biological world that are not mechanical, that don't match what we're capable of constructing, but we don't understand how they work. So we just say, well, that's not how it is. This, yeah, so, I mean, I'm, I'm painting with, I want to acknowledge, I'm painting with a very broad brush, some, mm-hmm. some big sweeping historical periods. But I, I think that it profoundly influences our perspective on the body now where I still hear people say like, oh, well, my knee is this. Mm-hmm. And this is what's going on in my knee and not acknowledging that what you're doing in your jaw affects your knee. And, and that seems like to people like a really crazy thing to say, a really like woo-woo <laughs> thing to say. I know, when we talked last time, that was like my pushback. It was all woo-woo, right? But it's not woo-woo. It's, it's not. It's really concrete <laughs> and it's getting to be measurable. Mm. And this is what's fascinating to me is that, that there are people now, scientists, researchers, who are capable of measuring the interconnectedness of things. And we're getting more and more sense of how um, we don't work separately. And our parts don't work separately. And our bones aren't really necessarily so different from our muscles. And there, there's, a, there's a time aspect to it also where for a long time in embryology, there was this idea that cells had fates and that they started down a road and, and they have all this potential and they're undifferentiated and then they differentiate and then they're on the road to being it's called a germ layer, like endoderm or ectoderm or mesoderm. And once they're on that road, they can't ever change. And you can't go from being endoderm to being ectoderm. Like, that's, like, that's a rule. Except yeah. for that it turns out that there's all kinds of movement backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. And it's not deterministic in that way. It's not a fate. And there's all kinds of adaption and change and self-correction. And the line between endoderm and ectoderm is not so bright as we used to think it was, and might not matter to a whole lot of people, but a, like a lot of us built our whole understanding of embryology about how those are really different, and now they're not. And is that a recent discovery? Yeah. Like how recent? Months. Wow. Yeah. I mean, the paper came out a couple months ago. I don't know how long ago they started researching it. I don't know when and the research And has it caused like a but... huge to-do in the embryological sphere? I don't know. Oh, I don't know about that because I'm not talking to the embryologists. I'm yeah. just reading the papers yeah. when they come out. So, um, I but I have the suspicion that I have this idea that that there's a layer of researchers and scientists who are not so shocked by this stuff because they're in it. Yeah. 
and they know that they don't know everything mm. and they know that they can't measure everything and then i think there's this other layer that's like a little more like translating down where people are trying to be deterministic about it mm. and say oh this means this and like it turns into this pop science that starts to get filtered down into the culture where then we grasp and we go okay well a glass of wine a day is going to help me <laughs> where when you go back and read the original paper it says their, you know, the, the thesis, that their, their hypothesis is that a glass of wine might, in some circumstances, help some people under these conditions, <laughs> which is completely different than everybody should drink, drink a, glass a glass of wine, wine every a day. day. Yes. Wow. So, the transla- so I suspect the embryologists are like, yeah, we don't know. Isn't this fascinating? Like, what we thought we knew, we don't know. And then there's this other layer of people who are, who... Like, we've read it in a book, so it must be true, or my teacher said it, so it must be true. And that, that layer of people who think that knowledge is, is, like, capturable rather than a process, that layer of people, when it comes out in a book, are gonna be, you know, will be like, whoa, I thought I knew this. Mm. And that's, I'm interested in that layer of people, which I have also been in myself. I mean, I'm like, I thought I knew this, and then, but enough I thought I knew has gotten thrown out that I'm getting a little more prosaic about, like, this is what I'm saying now, but some of it's going to be wrong. <laughs> so let's see what it does to our experience, because mm-hmm. the knowing part, the knowing part, it's not, it's, it's an illusion. Well, that's something I really got from your course a lot, that, again, this idea of studying anatomy turned into something different in my mind as to what that even means to study anatomy. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about in regards to our previous conversation too is that we talked about that time when we met Mark and we were in Allison's class together. And it was around that time where I, I don't know, I kind of came to something really huge, which was the poses don't matter. Mm-hmm. Like, it just doesn't matter what poses I do. Like, in terms of what the purpose of practice was for me, why I was doing it, and what the benefit I felt I was really getting from was, it was never about trying to make my body into anything. So I just decided, okay, I'm just going to come up with a set of really simple forms, and I just want to teach those really good. And that's all I'm going to do, because it doesn't really matter what poses it is. What I want to teach or what I want to focus on isn't that. Mm-hmm. So let's kind of just take that off the table. Mm-hmm. And I feel like, in some regards, I feel like you did a similar thing, but mm. it, you didn't, first, you didn't choose to like use a set of poses like me. You chose like anatomy as like your inquiry mm-hmm. into it. Mm-hmm. And then I'm sort of curious about that, your, your use of anatomy to get to the bottom of some of the questions that were brought up in that early time for us, like mm-hmm. when Mark said, oh, you don't have to fix yourself. And then why did that lead to embryology? Like it seems like in order to get more to the bottom of whatever it was you started with studying anatomy, you had, it just was a natural conclusion that you had to get into embryology. Mm. Mm. What was the first part of the question? I think it had to do with oh, anatomy learning as from Mark that we don't have to fix ourselves or this trying to fix ourselves might be the issue, something mm-hmm. like that. That's my words, not mm-hmm. yours. Mm-hmm. And that leading to you, rather than being focused on asana and being like a yoga teacher in a more traditional or not traditional conventional mm-hmm. sense, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but making anatomy more of what you wanted to do. Or were you already there? I don't, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm curious about going from Mark to like, your anatomy thing, and then your anatomy thing to what seems to be your real focus now, which is the embryology thing. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think, I mean, I was studying anatomy when I was studying with Mark, and, um, and he, I th- told this story other places, but like he really challenged me on why I was studying anatomy and kept giving me a hard time about me saying I needed to study anatomy to be a good teacher, and he kept saying, you don't need to, you know, kept saying, that's bullshit, just go teach. <laughs> and then I said to him, I'm studying anatomy because I love it. And he's like, great, then keep studying it. So to me, that, that idea that um, t- to get down to like, I, I like studying anatomy because it, it's a way in for me, but 
but getting over the like it will give me mastery or will teach me how to fix things or because I certainly went into anatomy thinking I was going to learn it and master it and um, then I would know things and I like knowing things and you know rattling off knowledge and and frankly I talked about this with Peter Blackaby too that in the yoga world anatomical knowledge garnered you like more something respect or something sure and it got me a lot of credibility and not a lot of people at the time knew anatomy or had studied as much anatomy as I had or um, at least in the yoga world and so um, it gave me a kind of expertise someone told me the other day subject matter expertise like I'm mm. a subject matter expert expertise yes yes, yes. and um which wasn't actually very satisfying. I'm like, I don't want to know stuff. I want to be a process expert. But that was part of like, you know, I would study anatomy. I'd take a course and I'd get all into something and I'd be like, okay, I've got this. And then I'd go study with someone else and I'd be like, oh, I thought I knew all this, but there's more. And there's always more. There's always like another layer of detail you can go into. Mm-hmm. And... Um, the carrot dangles. The carrot dangles, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. reach, same in yoga, you reach, it gets pulled away. Yeah, mm. yeah. And, and, and I think that studying body-mind centering really um, was a profound part of shifting my perspective on that. And to me, studying with Mark and studying with Bonnie go right together. And that um, the embodiment aspect of the study of body-mind centering. So not looking for, um, it's not studying anatomy to know stuff on the outside, but studying anatomy to see how it feels on the inside. And that idea of the embodied experience being the point and experiential learning being the point. Um, For me, studying BMC was really confronting sometimes because I could go in knowing, rattling off the names of things, but not be able to feel them in my body. And getting into that question of how I felt them in my body and that a lot of the ways that I felt things were really different than, than what Bonnie did or what my teacher suggested. And sometimes I felt like a real failure because I didn't feel what my teachers felt. Mm. Getting, to, getting to work and teach with Bonnie directly was really incredibly valuable for that because I would say to her, oh, well, I don't feel that, Bonnie, I feel this. And she said, great, it's that too. <laughs> so, you know, say to the classroom, like, do, it, do what Amy says or do what I say. Not do what I say, but like, okay, Amy's experience is one way to feel your blood moving and my experience is another way. Go find your own because here are you two teachers because we were both teaching, like, we don't have the same experience. So there's not one experience to have, which to me ties directly into what I had learned from Mark, that like, you don't, make the um, person fit the yoga, right? Make the yoga fit the person. So as people, we need to get to know ourselves. And as teachers, we need to, we need to hold space for someone to have their own experience. And I just want to jump in because you said something I think is just a super important point that came up for me recently, which is that it's not about being able to name things. Uh-uh. Because I talked about this a little bit on the podcast recently. I, I met uh, Rodney Yee recently, and I had kind of like a little altercation, not really altercation, but kind of a moment with him where you know, he was sort of testing me. He made this comment like, do you have enough tread on your tires? Like, do I know enough about yoga to like hold my own in a conversation with him was sort of <laughs> what he was doing. And at some point, he actually was sort of quizzing me. And he, qu- he said, he, I believe his question was, um, uh, what's the purpose of triangle pose? And I, fresh out of your class, said, well, I can only speak to what my experience of triangle pose is, and right now, and he went, oh, okay, whatever. And then I said, you know, right now I've got this issue with my sacroiliac joint, so when I'm doing triangle pose, I'm really trying to make it about feeling stability there, you know? And then he said, okay, so what muscle groups govern the sacroiliac joint? And I... I couldn't name them because, you know, frankly, I stopped coloring a little while back in your course because I just, it wasn't doing anything for me and I wanted to have my experience. But I actually said to him, I said, okay, so being a good yoga teacher is about being able to name muscle groups? And I just think that that's a misconception. And you just sort of said that you made that distinction between you could name it, but that's not the same thing as like what your experience is of it. And that your experience of it's going to probably be different than 
other people's experience. Yep. And and I'm going to say, like, what muscle groups govern the SI joint? Like, you tell me a muscle group. Name anyone in your body, and I can tell you what it has to do with the SI joint. <laughs> like, there's not one muscle. Anyway. Yeah. You know, the question's problematic to me. And, yeah. and yeah, I think that being able to name things are useful if we both understand what the words mean. Yeah. Like, for me to say to... To, or like for you and I to have a conversation about your SI joint and to say, you know, how your sit bones, what are you doing with your um, tail, what are you doing with the front of your spine, like so, so that we're speaking the same language, it's useful. But knowing it for the sake of knowing it isn't, doesn't mean anything. And I think there are a lot of people who, I mean, when I teach like sit bones and I'm like, okay, feel your sit bones, they're like, wait, that's where my sit bones are? Mm. So... It's like, it's like learning a language so that you can function in a culture. And the, but it doesn't make the language... Well, the language shapes our experience, for sure. Mm -hmm. So even when I go... Like I have been teaching in Italy a lot, and I don't speak Italian, but I, start, I feel like I start thinking a little bit in Italian, and the <laughs> phrasing is different. And the, mm -hmm. Because I hear myself translated into Italian and I start to hear like what I would sound like if I... Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it shapes my thinking and I start to, start to think that way. And I really wish I spoke another language fluently and I could pay more attention to that. But there's all kinds of research about how people's emotional experience changes if they are talking about their experience in different languages. Mm -hmm. Right. So... I jump in there because the reason why... I feel like when you when it becomes about naming things, that's when it it stops being a somatic experience, right? And that's what it seems like you're talking about. Like studying with Bonnie made anatomy less about being able to name it and book learning, and yeah. more about some somatic yeah. understanding of it. And there is some um, there is some like know the name of it so that you you know what you're going to look for in your body to go have that somatic experience. At least in body-mind centering, the language is anatomy and physiology and embryology. You always use that word signposts. Yeah. You're like, here's the signposts. Yeah, yeah. like here, here's, yeah. A, here's a way in. Here's a, um, so we're going to talk about femur. We're not going to talk about, like in, in BMC, we don't, well, some people do, but it's not part of the like, language of it necessarily. Like we're not talking about naughties. But we could talk. Like, naughties are another language. It's yeah. just another map, another way in. So learning to read a map is useful if, if you and someone are going on the same trip together, kind of, <laughs> right? And, mm -hmm. but, but translating the map, like, the map only has as much value as is useful. Because it gets you where you want to go. Because it gets you where you want to go. And uh, the problem with the anatomical map and kinesiological kind of muscle-oriented map is that we've made it have value in and of itself. And it is mm. only valuable if it helps you into your own experience. Because being able to stand up and rattle off the muscle, and I can rattle off the muscles around the SI joint, I've but seen it you do does it. not mean <laughs> anything. It means bupkis about my skill at being in my body. And someone cannot know any muscles, and they can have a profound experience of trikonasana. Mm. And I, I really profoundly disagree with the need to know the names of things to get into an asana. I don't, I don't think it's what it's about. And I think it's problematic because it starts to dissociate people from their bodies. Mm -hmm. Turns their bodies into machines. Turns their bodies into machines and into things to be managed. And the illusion, particularly in the muscle language, like we get this illusion of control, like I'm going to manage these muscles in my body. And that is not how the body works. It's not how the nervous system works. It's not how the um, neuromuscular system works. It's not how the cells work. It is not how it works. I don't think I'm going to fire mm -hmm. my glute medius to modulate my blood. Like it, I mean, I can think that, but that's not, how, that's not what's going on. <laughs> that's like my story I'm telling myself about control. And I'm sorry, you hear it all. I see the really well-intentioned people on Facebook putting out videos of how to do asana in more safe or biomechanically sound ways. Mm -hmm. And it's often about that. Do this to fire this because this does this mm -hmm. and that will equal that. Yes. And we're replacing one idea of control with another idea of control. And the biomechanical model 
as I'm hearing it put out there, is still about how do I control my body as if it is other and something to be fixed or something to be corrected or like something separate from me. Mm-hmm. And it, it's in our language. Like it's a, it's a flaw in the construct of the language that I even say my body. Mm-hmm. Like the me that is my tissue. Mm-hmm. That's why I have to say the thing that I call my shoulder. That's why you were yeah. laughing because something I learned from you is like how we talk about it. It's expressive of our, our yeah. idea of it. Yeah, yeah. And like my shoulder, like, like you own it, like you bought it at the grocery store or something like the me that is this yeah. as opposed to the me that is this or the me that is this or, yeah. So, okay, so studying with Bonnie took your anatomy study in a different direction. Yeah. In this more, I keep using the word somatic because it seems like the right word. And then you did that for a while. That's when you came up with embodied asana. The word embodied became a signifier for you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So why, how does that get to embryology? Um, well, partly because that, that right when I was studying BMC, Bonnie was beginning to bring the embryology in. She so was doing that too. She was doing that too. So I got to it through studying with Bonnie and, and body-mind centering and... But I found it fascinating, um, I mean, partly because it's got a lot of detail, and I love following detail. It just and tickled it's, your fancy. It just tickled my fancy. You're like a new area for me to get into. Exactly. Like, it's, yeah. it's, it's detailed, and it's geeky, and, but it's also, it's also, like, it's magic. It's the origin. It's the origin. And I was just mm-hmm. talking to someone about superhero movies, and they're really frustrated with all the origin stories coming out. And I'm like, I love the origin stories. Like, I don't want the big battles. I want to hear like, I want to yeah. hear every chapter of Wolverine's life before we got to <laughs> yeah. X Men. How did Batman become Batman? How did Batman? Yeah, I yeah. love origin <laughs> stories, and embryology is like this origin story of and our bodies of and our ideas. Bodies. And it's so much about. Um, process and and I appreciate at the same time it's challenging that like as soon as I fix on like okay well now I got this thing about embryology like the next minute the name of it changes like I mean the name of the tissue you're looking at or like and there's all of this change and it's like now it's like this and now it's like this and now it's called this and then it's going to become this and and the yeah you can't name one thing because in three weeks it's going to be something else it's so changing Exactly, exactly. And there's no locking on to like, well, this is how it is. Because the tissue itself is changing its, its um, responsiveness or it's changing its, its structure or it's changing who it relates to or who it's migrating over here and having a whole different conversation. So the, the, the idea that, that we, are, we are processes in relationships more than we are things hmm. really... I feel like it's so expressed in embryology and I love it about it. Yeah, I was just thinking that, I was thinking about time for a second because in the beginning, it's so fast. Mm -hmm. That unfolding, that actual folding that (laughs) happens, the layers, the layers that I learned from you, right? Like that unfolding, um, it happens so quickly at the beginning. Yeah. And then it's almost as if we, we think that at some point that stops happening but it is still happening. We're still, still unfolding happening. just the time slows down. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's like the, it's a proportional thing, right? So if you're, if you're four weeks old, something that takes a week is a quarter of your life, right. right? Or if you're four days old, something that takes two days is half your life. Right. So the per, the like percentage of your life you spend in these things, and it then the, the kind of the bigness of the change, and so these changes are still happening in our lives. But I'm 48 years old, so something that takes a month is not mm-hmm. half of my life anymore, mm-hmm. but it's still happening. And and in my body, the the proportional the proportions aren't quite the same, but there are still cycles in my body that are like a month long. Or the lifespan of a kind of tissue is arising and dispersing in a week or something. And so there, that amount, the amount of transformation and change that is happening in my body for me to keep relatively the same form is huge. <laughs> like that I'm about the same height and I'm about the same size, my skin about the same color. and my, Like to maintain that, there is constant change going on inside me. 
Mm-hmm. It's amazing. <laughs> it really is. And I guess that's, that comes out so much in what you're doing and that makes sense. Even like the little bit of embryology you've offered in your anatomy course, it's so like profound and magical what takes place. Yeah. And to think that that's what I am, mm-hmm. as opposed to this other idea of my body like this machine that's not me, it really, um, it changes something. It's hard for me to put words on what it changes. Mm. Mm. But I feel like that's what you're trying to communicate more than anything. Yeah. For me, and I mean, I'm curious if you could put words to what it changes for you. But for me, what I'm trying to convey is that change happens. Mm -hmm. And change is always possible. And one of the things I find most frustrating in myself and in other people is like, I can't help it. That's just how I am. Like, it's not true. Now, the reasons we might not change can be really profound. Like Change can be really scary. The way I am might be the way I know how to function in the world, so I can't change it without losing some sense of myself. But the idea that we are unchanging and separate is not how... It's not what our physiology is doing. And yes... For me, what comes next out of that is, so how do we bring about change? We don't have to bring it about. It's just going to happen. Okay. Right. Okay, how does it happen then? Instead of it's not us bringing about. So I want to, here, I want to go back to my example from before. Yep. um, About the thing that I call my shoulder um, and the idea that I had about it. um, Because I think it's maybe a good example of what we're, what I think I got from your course so much, which is really subtle. It's like, just for me to you, like I feel like what you're doing is quite exquisite and subtle. And it really, how it goes in is not through the direct door. I don't know how to say it. Like the way it came into me was very wild. So so I, I was doing a thing with my shoulders, which was like a little up and back. And that was, I thought, a smarter choice than what I was originally taught, which was back and down which is like a standard Iyengar thing that we all learned to create stability through our shoulder girdle was to knit the shoulder blades in and wrap them down and back. And I did that for a long time. And Allison was the one who said, oh no, you can let them come up some. And she used to say, grabbing the nape of the cat's neck, which I think actually goes to letting the shoulder blade go with the arm more Mm -hmm. than what they were doing in the Iyengar method. But I took that to like, a stupid degree. Like I, I turned up this idea of grabbing the nape of my neck because I had this idea that it was going to alleviate tension around the base of my neck and encourage cervical curve because I had like a military, or someone told me when they looked at an x-ray of mine years ago that I had military neck and that that was sending my spine off to one side and that's why I got the tingling and numbing down my arm. So I always had this idea, I have military neck, which means I don't have enough cervical curve. And so if I take my shoulders up and back, I had this idea that it was gonna do that. Mm -hmm. But in your course, we did this thing where we were doing this partnering and we were just observing without trying to make any judgments about what we saw and a lovely fellow participant observed something about my thoracic spine, which is, oh, there's like a spot here where it looks like there's no curve. <laughs> and I went home and looked in the mirror and I could see it. And I could see how, oh shit, when I take my shoulders up and back, it's going right to that spot that I flattened out this little bit of my thoracic curve. Mm-hmm which I think was certainly causing some issues. And as soon as I saw that, as soon as I thought that, it was as if I can no longer continue to do that. Mm -hmm. I've had to change what I'm teaching. I feel like I need to put out new information. But just this, there was like a little switch that happened in my mind about it. And at first I've talked, I've described how it feels like I'm the hunchback of Notre Dame when, <laughs> when they're in what I think now is a more natural place. I'm so used to having them the other way. But how that happened in me, that little switch of my idea about my body totally changed how, my, how I'm in my body now, mm-hmm. how I understand it. Mm-hmm. So I say all of that is like, 
in this question of how do we make practice safer or how do we practice in ways that's more fruitful, it's going to have to be addressing these ideas, right? Yeah. To me, what's really significant about what you said is that you went home and you saw something and you changed. And that what I heard in your story is like someone told you something and you took it on. And you, and I mean, maybe you did, but the way you told the story, you didn't, you took it on and you didn't check it for yourself and say, huh, what do I feel? You just said, okay, they said this, so this is how I am. And then something about the process of being in the class, being witnessed, having someone say what they saw, and then you went home and checked it. I mean, and looked in the mirror and said, oh, what's my, and let me try this out. And like, let me see how I feel in it. And acknowledge I feel a hunchback of the Notre Dame, but I'm hearing this from the outside. And that intersection where you get to decide what you're going to take on from the outside, that the outside is still important. Like outside observations are incredibly valuable. But there's a huge difference between just taking it on and saying, well, they said this about me, so it must be true. And saying, what part of that is true for me? What am I going to entertain? What am I not going to entertain? What am I going to say, like... There's a ton of stuff that people tell us, which is their idea about us, that might be interesting. And I'm like, huh, I didn't know you thought that about me, but <laughs> it's not my experience of me. And that, I mean, it's still their experience of me, so that's true. But, but the, the, to me, the, um, that you felt like you got to question what your experience was and you got to get change it, that's what's important. And, you know, I said before, change just happens. It, it does, it, change would, mm, maybe, maybe I think this, change will happen if we let it. But we get these ideas about ourselves and then we, we hold on to them in some way. And we're often in a state of not letting change happen. And we're often in a state of saying, like, I know this, don't let it change because change is dangerous and, or bad. Or I know what I know and I got it worked out and I've got this mastered. I got it named. I got it named. I got it. I got it worked out. I know this thing about my shoulders. And... If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.